from World News Tonight. Assassination attempt. Iraq's Prime Minister targeted in the latest slew of politically driven hitmen attempts. Major milestone. Women around the world celebrate as China's first female takes a stroll in space. Welcome home. America opens up to the rest of the world after nearly two years, despite surging infection fears. Exorbitant masterpiece. One artist reveals a record-breaking picture frame laden with glistening charm. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with an assassination attempt. An explosive-laden drone attacked the Baghdad resident of Iraq Prime Minister. Despite some of his security guards being injured, the PM was unharmed. This follows violent unrest over recent election results. Both the US and the UK condemned the attack, calling it an apparent act of terrorism. Baghdad residents on Sunday criticized an apparent assassination attempt against Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa al kadimi Officials say he escaped unharmed after armed drones targeted his residence in the Green Zone. The incident has dramatically raised tension in the country weeks after a general election disputed by Iran-backed militia groups. On Friday, there were violent clashes between government forces and supporters of the Iran-backed political parties, many of whom have armed wings, who lost dozens of seats in the October 10 poll. Footage from the Prime Minister's office released on Sunday showed some of the damage. A vehicle parked outside the home was seen with its windows blown out, surrounded by rubble and debris from the impact. No group immediately claimed responsibility. The United States, Saudi Arabia and Iran condemned the attack, with the US offering assistance with the investigation. Dozens of nations pledged to do more to protect nature and overhaul farming at the COP26 UN climate talks, amid misgivings about past failures. Organisers feared the worst, so the announcements coming out of Glasgow are at least reassuring. After the first week of discussions, the COP26 participants reached a consensus on a number of measures to rein in greenhouse gas emissions. But on Saturday, environmental activists across the world took to the streets fed up with distant targets and lack of concrete action. For them, it's time to hold the world's leaders to account, starting with the $100 billion a year in climate financing to help poorer nations transition to greener energy, which was supposed to materialize last year. One of the key commitments so far is limiting the use of coal. More than 20 new countries added their pledge to end the use of the most polluting of all fossil fuels by 2030. But conspicuously absent from the signatories, two of the biggest users of coal, China and the US. However, Washington did join other countries in agreeing to end the financing of fossil fuel projects abroad. It's another significant announcement, with international financing worth 12 to 15 billion euros per year. Among the other announcements, a commitment to end deforestation by 2030 and reducing methane emissions by 30 percent. Holding all partners to their pledges will be difficult, especially for developing countries. Indonesia, home to the world's third largest rainforest, has already reneged on its commitment to stop deforestation. But there have been some signs of progress, with the European Union, the United Kingdom and United States among signatories of an $8.5 billion partnership to wean South Africa off coal. As for carbon emissions, the outlook remains bleak. After a slight dip in 2020, thanks to the coronavirus pandemic, greenhouse gas emissions have resumed their upward trajectory and are now close to pre-COVID levels. The United Nations says the world is heading for catastrophic global warming of 2.7 degrees Celsius by 2030, far beyond the two-degree limit agreed at COP21 in Paris. Despite continuing talks for climate action, citizens of Australia do not believe enough is being done to tackle issues they say may lead to life or death situations for future generations. For more on this, we have other there in the world. Your special correspondent Timothy Phillips reporting now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy? Yes, Anuradhi. More than 1,000 people demonstrated in Australia's biggest cities of Sydney and Melbourne to protest against the government's climate policies and the strategies it offered at a UN climate summit in Glasgow. 
Sydney's first legal protest after a months long COVID-19 lockdown saw about 1,000 people march in support of Global Action Day for Climate Justice. A worldwide movement mobilized during the COP26 meeting. A week of government speeches and pledges at the two-week gathering in Glasgow bought promises to phase out coal slash emissions of the potent greenhouse gases, methane and cut deforestation. Australia, however, has rejected the global methane pledge and campaigners and pressure groups have not been impressed by the commitments of other world leaders. Back to you, Andrew. All right, thank you. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillips reporting from Melbourne in Australia. We have some good news for you. An Israeli startup has joined the fight against global warming by seeking inspiration in the upper atmosphere, where it hopes to send fleets of balloons that will trap carbon dioxide for re recycling. Carbon dioxide emissions from the burning of fossil fuels and from industrial agriculture are the main cause of climate change. But removing CO2 from the atmosphere at standard temperatures requires too much energy for governments and companies to consider it cost effective. High Hopes Lab developed a system that captures the carbon where it has almost solidified, far above the Earth. The company has tested its system on a small scale, releasing gas-filled balloons with a box that serves as a carbon capture device attached underneath. The frozen carbon is then separated from the air to be brought back to Earth and can be recycled. The company aims to build larger balloons within two years that could each be deployed to remove a ton of carbon a day and at cost below $100, much less than comparable on on-ground facilities currently in use. North Korea conducted an artillery fire competition, which is unusual for the regime to unveil such activity with its leader, Kim Jong-un, unattended. Pyongyang's state media reported Sunday that North Korea carried out an artillery fire competition the day before in an effort to boost the regime's defense capabilities. The leader Kim Jong-un was not present at the site. Instead, Park Jong-chun, a member of the Presidium of the Power Bureau of the ruling party, guided the event. Though it's unusual for the North to showcase such a competition without their leader present, an expert noted that it's a part of Kim's governing style. Another expert pointed out that Gim's absence could be an attempt by the North to downplay the event, insisting that such activities are ordinary and purely defensive, while at the same time sending a message to the U.S. and its allies. Pyongyang has a long urged Washington to drop so-called double standards over military activities as well as hostile policies against the regime. The regime's weekly propaganda publication over the weekend also criticized the recent hard Washington joint air exercises, slamming that the nature of such activity cannot be weakened, whether they're scaled down or behind closed doors. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Astronaut Wang Yeping has become the first Chinese woman to walk in space as part of a six-month mission to the country's space station. Wang and fellow astronaut Zai Ziyang left the main module of the Tiangong station for more than six hours to install equipment and carry out tests alongside the station's robotic arm as part of its ongoing construction. Wang 41 and Zai have previously traveled to China's now retired experimental space stations. Both waved to the camera while tethered to the outside of the station. Tiangong is expected to operate for at least 10 years and the three astronauts are the second group to stay there with Wang being the first woman. Their work involves setting up equipment equipment and testing technology for future construction with at least one more spacewalk planned. The team is expected to spend six months at the station. Three spacewalks are planned to install equipment in preparation for the station's expansion, while the crew will also assess living conditions in the Tianhe module and conduct experiments in space medicine and other fields. Following the approval of booster jabs for specific groups in Germany, the fear of yet another infection surge has caused the government to give an all-round approval for the booster in hopes of using it to control the pandemic. For more on this, we have other there in the world news special correspondent Inukur Ponso reporting from Cleve in Germany. Yes, Anuradi. Health Minister Jens Spahn said Germany's COVID-19 situation is entering a very difficult period with rising number of intensive care patients as German state leaders warn the country may need a new lockdown unless it takes urgent action. Spahn said he had agreed with regional health ministers that in future everyone should be offered a booster shot of COVID-19 vaccine six months after receiving their previous injection. 
at a news conference in southern Germany where he and the country's state health ministers gathered for a two-day meeting. He announced that this should become the norm and not the exception. In Berlin, Chancellor Angela Merkel's spokesman told reporters the current number of infections was very worrying. Earlier, two state leaders mentioned that new lockdown might be needed unless the country takes immediate action to reverse a surge in cases. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Inuko Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. The United States reopens its land and air borders to foreign visitors fully vaccinated against COVID-19, ending 20 months of restrictions on travel from around the globe that separated families, hobble tourism and strained diplomatic ties. With COVID-19 travel restrictions to the U.S. lifted for much of the world Monday, airlines and officials are bracing for an influx of international visitors. United Airlines is expecting about 50% more international inbound passengers Monday than the 20,000 it had a week ago, and Delta Airlines has warned travelers to prepare for long lines. Delta said in the six weeks since the U.S. reopening was announced, it has seen a 450 percent increase in international bookings from the previous six weeks. The Biden administration has held multiple calls with U.S. airlines to prepare for the influx of travelers and has warned travelers crossing from Canada and Mexico by land or ferry to be prepared for longer waits starting Monday. The rules had barred most non-U.S. citizens from entering from 33 countries. Airlines will check vaccination documents for international travelers and new rules will require airlines to collect passenger information for potential contact tracing. At land borders, U.S. Customs and Border Protection will ask if travelers have been vaccinated and spot check some documentation. Children under 18 are exempt from the new vaccine requirements, but all international travelers must provide a negative COVID-19 test. At least two investigations, one of them criminal, wound away into the deadly stampede during rap star Travis Scott's Astro World Music Festival that killed at least eight people and injured dozens in Houston. A day after the tragic Astro World Festival in Houston, investigators tried to understand the course of events. Hours before the stampede, many were already overexcited bypassing security as they arrived at Energy Park. The Travis Scott concert was sold out and some tried to attend without tickets. Pressure escalated at 9 p.m. The crowd pushed towards the stage. Some were pressed so hard they couldn't breathe and fainted. These images show an ambulance treating the first victims while the concert continues. A few officers at that part of the site were overwhelmed. Half an hour later, several people were on the ground and being trampled over. Organizers said they're shocked and sent condolences to victims' families, thanking police for intervening fast, while investigators examined the site and videos to understand what led to one of the deadliest concerts in U.S. history. Sudanese security forces fired tear gas at multiple anti-coup rallies, with protesters in several cities joining a call for two days of civil disobedience against last month's military takeover. <laughs> Only a few hundred protesters came out to demonstrate in Khartoum, in neighboring Omdurman, and in a handful of other cities against General Burhan's new military government. And even that was not easy. The internet and phone services being down since the coup on October 25th. People have communicated through text messages, trying to organize their opposition to what's going on in Khartoum, the dissolution of the government and the arrest of several of its members. The man in power, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, says this is not a coup, but a reorientation of the transition saying the prime minister detained in his home is safe and promising to leave office once the transition is over. Civil society leaders, Sudan's Professionals Association, who played a key role in bringing down longtime dictator Omar al-Bashir, are determined to restore the transition. 
They were holding a civil disobedience strike with local resistance committees, calling on international powers to pressure the military. The situation is tense. Several people have been killed in previous protests. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A police official was injured after being stabbed with a knife in Cannes, southern France, and his assailant has been neutralized. The attack in Cannes comes as worries over violent crime and terrorism feature among voters' main concerns in the run-up to the 2022 French presidential election. Moscow residents returned to work after an 11-day long stretch of holidays known as the non-working period. Vehicular traffic, bus and train services were hit in Chennai due to heavy rainfall that led to inundation. In many areas, traffic was diverted and waterlogging was reported from various places as Chennai experienced heavy rainfall overnight. Strolling casually with their machine guns in hand, Taliban fighters enjoyed a rare day off with a visit to popular waterside amusement park in Kabul. Nicaraguans voted in a presidential election marked by longtime President Daniel Ortega's ruthless campaign to extend his tight grip on power by jailing critics in a contest the United States has dismissed as a sham. And finally tonight, adorned with more than 10,000 diamonds and worth at least 1.5 million pounds, renowned artist Debbie Wingham says her latest sparkling creation is the world's most expensive picture frame. Known as the world's most expensive artist for her record-breaking, pricey fashion and cake creations, Wingham crafted the diamond-encrusted circular frame with an image of a clock face with Roman numerals. Revealed in Dubai for the first time, the frame, soon to be put on sale, was created with an eco-luxury ethos, re using reclaimed material and reclaimed diamonds, and holds an oil painting by Wingham of Dubai's Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building. Not content with coating the painting in diamond dust, a finishing material popular with many artists, Wingham sourced platinum dust to varnish the image in a novel sparkle. Wingham said the mega sparkle is balanced with the reclaimed metal which gives the contrast of the old and new and also keeps the visual aesthetic. The fanciest stones in the frame include five flawless four-carat white diamonds worth £250,000 each and a giant six-carat sapphire worth £80,000. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other there in English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Chanel will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.